Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much indeed for your introduction and for inviting me to address this August audience. And I hope that I'm able to share with you some of my experiences so that perhaps some of you may have uh, some takeaways which may be of some value to you. I would like to start off this discussion, first of all, <clears throat> by just giving a, a brief background about my relationship with uh, Dr. Hassan Shul Murad. He joined our group and he was really attached to me as a financial analyst. And he assisted me at that time in developing the feasibility report for the expansion of the Daud Hercules Fertilizer Project. In 1990, he set up the Institute of Leadership and Management, along with his father. And he was an individual who started with really nothing. But in a short period of time of his life, he has created an incredible institution uh, in the UMT, the ILM, being uh, graduated and became the UMT has become an absolutely remarkable success story. And I would like to, to share, I think, that he and I really had the same approach to leadership. And therefore, I feel honored that I may be actually uh, sharing with you the same frame of reference that has brought about the degree of success that he has had and a little bit about the degree of success that I have had the privilege to have enjoyed. When my father died in 2002, we had a group with a turnover at that time of just short of three billion rupees. Today, the turnover of our group is 226 billion rupees. It's about 76 times growth. I started off in 1968 when I joined the world of work, or as I call it, the great university of life. And at that time, as you know, by 1971, we had lost East Pakistan. 1972, we experienced nationalization. Our group at that time, which has achieved its zenith in 1967, when it was a group of which employed 35,000 people, and had a value at that time of a quarter of a billion dollars, that group lost half its assets in East Pakistan, and the remaining assets in West, West Pakistan, half of them were national. So while I was born into a position of privilege where people would look at me and say, well, you were born with a golden spoon, you had everything going for you. I just wanted to set the context to explain that, you know, Allah Ta'ala in his infinite wisdom challenges all of us. It doesn't matter what is your birth. What does matter is the tests that you will be facing and how you overcome them. And in that process, how you're able to develop your leadership capabilities so that you can help the nation develop, I'm in the, uh, obviously in the corporate sector, Dr. Hassan was in the education sector, but I consider his achievements as important, if not more important than mine. So, at that time, in 1971, after we lost East Pakistan and in 72 we nationalized, naturally there, were, there was a, an environment which is extremely anti-private sector. And in that, private, in that environment, it led to a creation of conflicts within the family about the way forward. 
because we were being, we felt that we were being really um, attacked from all sides. Family, family discord obviously took place and it took quite some time in order to resolve those. However, in, 19, in 2002, my father passed away and I had to assume the responsibilities that he had a big queen. At that time, we were in a difficult situation and we had to develop the fundamental base of the, of the business so that we could grow. And as I have explained to you, that by the grace of God, after 18 years, we were able to grow 76 times. But what I want to share with you is my learnings on the issue of leadership. The title we have today is of course, Learning and Leadership. So what I'd like to share with you is the practical side that I have experienced. And I hope that you would be able to appreciate or take away some of the learnings for your own to improve your own situations in life. Basically, what is leadership? Is it an inborn characteristic? My answer to that is no, it's not inborn. It is something that can be learned. It is something that can be acquired. But there is a process. And the process starts by, first of all, develop leading yourself. If you can't lead yourself, the chances of you being able to lead others in a manner which would benefit them as well as yourself is significantly diminished. So you have to lead yourself. But how do you lead? Well, I will give you what in the, in the um, vernacular of the world today is a sort of a formula. First of all, you've got to realize that the most important part of leadership is what is the time dimension that you're addressing? Is it the next five years, 10 years, or is it a lifetime? If it's a lifetime, then naturally your appreciation and your ability to learn will be totally different from if you have a short time frame like five years. So early on I adopted the first and most important variable was that this is for a lifetime. Then I realized that in order to be able to address all the tests and challenges that I was undergoing, it was only possible if I could ensure consistency. Consistency of what? Consistency of decision making. All of us make decisions. I have the same weaknesses that all of you have. I was at that time a person who had a lack of self-confidence, person who had fears, a person who was daunted by the challenges in front of me, a person who was significantly affected in terms of the influences that were around him and the challenges that were thrown at me by all the various events and occurrences that took place. So like everybody else, I too was struggling. Looking back, I realized that some of the fundamental decisions I made about leadership, but that first of all, I had to develop a sense of humility. And in doing so, there had to be a methodology, a way of going forward. I realized that decision-making was the key. Every decision has a double accountability. It has an accountability, an instant accountability to yourself immediately, 
any doubts I had in accountability on the day of judgment. Because you have to accept the fundamental principle that we all have to die. And when we die, we will be held accountable. There are no free, free lunches in life. There has to be accountability. And without accountability, then you have immature behavior that you can make any decision you like because there's no accountability. So accountability is fundamental to success. And it's accountability that drives us to improve. So first of all, I decided that I have to, accepting the principle of accountability, I said that the best way to go forward was to make decisions which were consistent. In other words, each succeeding decision would be supporting the previous decision. And if I could go through life making these type of decisions with each new decision supporting the previous decisions, then my probability of achieving would be higher than it would be if I kept changing the direction. In other words, I make a decision and then maybe several decisions later, I make a decision which reverses the previous decisions. So consistency of decision-making is very important. And to me, it's quite obvious that a person who is consistent in his decision-making will definitely succeed, whereas uh, as compared to a person who does not make de consistent decisions. So how do you inform, uh, how do you ensure consistent decisions? Well, you have to realize that decision-making is not just in the business world. It is in all aspects of life. It's to do with family, it's to do with friends, it's to do with society, it's to do with the country. It has to be in totality. So you need to have an, a framework which will allow you to make consistent decisions. So what is that framework that will allow you to make consistent decisions no matter what your occupation is in life? First of all, it's a realization that each one of us is responsible for our own development. Each one of us strives for self-actualization. And it is that desire which motivates us to face the tests and the difficulties that come along the journey of life to be able to overcome them and co overcome them successfully. And to realize that every time we are successful in overcoming a certain test, then we are that much stronger to face the next test. But it is those tests will help us to grow, without which there's no way that you can grow. A life of ease does not go well for those who wish to self-actualize. So therefore, one should have an attitude, a positive attitude to welcome those tests, but in the process, never give in. Never give in what? Never give in so that you result in making inconsistent decisions. So how do you ensure the inconsistent decisions? I realized that for me, you know, I'm not intellectual, but I'm a practical person. And so I decided that I would go to the source of knowledge, that's the Holy Quran, which is the book of wisdom. All other writings by humankind are books of knowledge. The Quran is a book of wisdom. So I thought to myself, why shouldn't I go to the Quran, go to the, go to the one that really matters and try to learn whatever I can from that. And what did I learn? I learned to develop a frame of reference which allowed me to make consistent decisions. And what was that? It is a fact 
that you have to ex accept certain fundamentals. Those fundamentals are that you have to speak the truth. Always speak the truth. No matter what the losses are, you have to speak the truth. And always identify with the truth. So, that's the first decision, fundamental decision I made. I made a decision that I'm always going to speak the truth. And I'm not going to vary from that, no matter what my losses are. With that, I was able to then free my creative mind to concentrating on how best to address challenges. Because if you are inconsistent, you are not able to give all of your energy to overcoming the challenges that confront you. So, having made that decision, I realized that first of all, I have to develop myself. So the first thing we learn lies about leadership, what we learn is leading oneself. First of all, developing ourselves. And if you don't have the habit of speaking truthfully to yourself, then how will you speak truthfully to others? Because you can't, you can't pretend that you don't know that you're speaking untruths. You know. So I would advise that every one of us in the morning, look at yourself in the mirror and say, can I trust you? Do you speak the truth? Do you speak the truth consistently? Without variation. So that is the beginning of leadership in my mind. Second thing that I learned was honoring commitments. And this is what we're told in the Quran. Honor your commitments. And that is a difficult task. Even today, I suffer a lot on that account because, for example, I'm usually quite late in going to a, 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 uh, an event or a, or a social event or whatever. And I try all the time to improve. So long as I keep trying, I'm not defeated. I'm not a failure. I may fail, but I'm not a failure. There's a large difference between the two. So I keep failing, but I won't give in. Failure only comes when you accept that you have failed. So long as you don't accept that you fail, well, each failing gives you the ability to learn more because we learn by failing and not by success. So these are very important development uh, phases that you go through. So, we are realize that commitment to oneself, and many of all of us try to change ourselves. We try to make commitments and we fail at them. But if we don't accept them as, as a failure, we're still in the game. We can keep trying to improve. So commitment is the next important point. When you have both of those, it leads to a situation of having trust in oneself. And if you have trust in oneself, then you have secured a very important achievement. Why is that so important? It's because it really, really builds up your self-confidence. I have yet to come across anybody with supreme self-confidence. I think my father's quite like that, but I don't need to achieve supreme self-confidence. Because if you have to be self-confident, I feel that it will actually retard oneself. 
because you will not then consider these challenges and these difficulties and these tests as, as your stepping stones for further self-actualization. Once you have got, been able to develop this within yourself, then you go to the next stage, which is called leading others. When you lead others, that is when you have the capacity to multiply yourself through organization. And this is what Dr. Hassan Murad did. He was able to get together a team, a team of people who identified with him, identified with what he was doing. And he was able to consult them and make decisions. And the, the, all the multiple decisions he made has resulted in the outstanding achievements that he has left, he's bequeathed the world. So that's what I try to do too. So I like to consult. When I consult others, I'm very, very insistent upon the fact that they give me what they think and not what they think I want to hear. For example, I did invite uh, qual uh, uh, qualified people to join the board of Engro. And I was asked by that director, Am I allowed to give you my view openly, candidly? I said, if you don't give me a view candidly, you're no use to me. I'll find somebody else. So in my approach is I encourage all board members, and all uh, others who interact with me to speak candidly, to speak openly without fear and total security. And I say to them, the most you can do is make a mistake. And then you learn from that. But for me, mistakes are divine tests. It's a nice way to learn. So that, what does that mean? It means that I as a leader, when I'm leading others, I'm actually encouraging them to develop themselves by expressing themselves. And we learn from the body, from each other. So we start to grow. And when your team grows and understands and starts to think at a high level, the contribution and the quality that they are able to contribute dramatically increases. And so really the success that we've had in Anglo and in, in the group, which 76 times growth and revenue is entirely based on the team. It's not based on me. It's the team that was able to bring about this type of growth. And if you look at the life of the Holy Prophet, he too developed a team, a team of like-minded people whom he developed and allowed to speak with candor. And so, therefore, was able to make decisions. And you see the results of that. The, their results, which have never been equaled in the history of the world. So we see now that leading others requires the fact that the leader has to trust his team and the team members have to trust the leader. When does that trust come? Only when you speak the truth and when you honor your commitments. So that they, every member knows there is a sense of security all around them, and they can speak and participate and take ownership wholeheartedly. So that means we go from leading self to leading others. And then when you've led others, then you start to lead organizations. Now, in Engro, for example, we have very uh, developed governance structure. What is governance structure? What is the relevance of it? The relevance of it is that you define the 
processes by which decisions are made. And through the governance structure, you're able to delegate authority, which is commensurate with responsibility. And there is the principle of accountability. And on top of that, there is, there is a principle of reward and compensation. So everybody feels empowered to make a decision. Everybody feels that they're not going to be overridden by the boss just because the boss has a different attitude, a different concept in mind. What is that concept? That concept is what we today are really struggling with in our country. It is a concept of control. Control is a very negative attitude. What it does, it restricts human development, it restricts performance, it restricts uh, quality achievements. So therefore, I never exercise control. I instead endeavor to empower others to make decisions. I never sign a check in my life. I'm not responsible. I'm at the board level. In our organization, the board has no executive authority. The executive authority belongs to the chief executive and his team. And there's nobody in the board that can override them individually. The board can only override them collectively. So the chief executive has the confidence that he can make decisions and he can lead the enterprise without having the board constantly looking over his shoulder, but rather the board empowers him and therefore he performs with great confidence and he can make decisions and deliver the results. So we're very clear in our organization. I have no executive authority at all. And I ensure that the board never ever gets involved in any form of executive decision making. The job of the board is to ensure values, is to ensure that the DNA of the, of the organization, the culture, is based on those values. Is to, is to determine the direction of, of growth. It is, to, it is to mandate the strategy that management will develop. It is to give its, its decision on major investment uh, commit, uh, commitments to investments. It is to promote, it is to identify and appoint the chief executive. It is to delegate and empower the chief executive to perform. It is to set the key, the key performance criteria for the chief executive to perform. And it is to ensure that there's a governance structure which would, which would actually monitor how decisions are made within the organization for each, in the, each level making decisions within the framework that has been specified. Those are the responsibilities of the board. And that's all we do. The management, on the other hand, is responsible for delivering the results. And the management is responsible for what I call the operational side of business. In other words, they make all the operating decisions. And those operating decisions are then reflected in an income statement. And at the end of the year, that income statement is the basis in which the board then makes decisions about the allocation of the funds of the profits that are made. Okay? If I was to apply the same concept to the individual. The individual is making operating uh, uh, decisions. All of us are. As we go down life's highway, we're making operating decisions. So in some form, it's like a, having an income statement. What happens 
is that those are accumulated into a balance sheet. And the balance sheet is our soul. So as we make decisions which are operational in nature, those decisions will either add value to our soul or subtract value. So the principle of accountability is instant. As you make decisions, so you will either benefit your soul or you will retard its development. And it's in all aspects of life, not just in the business world. And so you see how the soul develops. And when it develops, that's where you get self-actualization. As your whole, the ethos of your whole personality rises, as you make consistent decisions, and consistent decisions, I already told you, is based on values. It's not based on what I get. It's based on my values. And always making decisions which are, or are fundamentally for the benefit of all rather than for benefit of self. And to hold self accountable for that. And then you develop your reputation. It's that reputation which is truly the wealth that you have earned. Look at the fantastic uh, accolades that are stated for the, in the Kaiviasa, both from those who are detractors as well as those who are supporters. Outstanding. Wouldn't one more like that when one is facing death at the final days, one then says, really, was I able to develop a reputation? Because that's what you're going to take away with you. And that's what you're going to leave behind. All the other worldly things are irrelevant. So this approach also helps you to get a balance in your life of the importance or the unimportance of worldly things. And instead, it gives you a sense of harmony, a sense of peace within yourself. But ultimately, at the end of the day, that is what matters. But we may never forget that we are, after all, imperfect, and we will make mistakes. And as I said to you, mistakes and blessings. That's all I've implemented in my life. It's all I've tried to do. Always keeping to my values, inviolably. Never tell lies, never take advantage. And always think for the benefit of all. And this is exactly what Dr. Hassan Mullah did. And therefore, I, f I feel his his, his presence, which I know that he followed the same principle. For he could not have achieved what he had achieved without that, in my opinion. So we realize it is a frame of uh, reference that matters. The frame of reference is the foundation of consistent decision making. It's been such a privilege to share my experiences in my life with you. I'm truly grateful for you, to you for giving me the time and for inviting me to be the speaker at this first memorial talk on, uh, for Dr. Hassan Sarag Morad. And I'm grateful to all of you for being, uh, for being so gracious and, and honoring me by your presence. Thank you so much. Stop.